Hello and welcome to another edition of Kent Thinks Discovers. Today we'll be screening the Mohawk of Consciousness, where we'll explore the use of groundbreaking technology to look inside the brain of patients who are in an unresponsive state. A little later on, we'll be talking to Dr. Srivas Chenu from the University of Kent, Dr. Anita Rose from the Raphael Hospital, and Cambridge Professor David Menon, who will all be here to answer your questions, which you can send in via the Facebook and YouTube live comments panel. Uh, and as ever, as we're all remoting in from our various homes, we may encounter some technical issues, uh, so do bear with us as we sort those out. But that's all for me for the time being. Here is the Mohawk of Consciousness. So I'm just going to place this in here to please keep your eyes closed. That feels a bit weird. Sort of looks like a bathing cap. What we're doing here is taking the science of consciousness and building tools that we can use at the bedside to assess patients after brain injury to have a better estimate of how conscious they might be, even if they can't express that in their behavior. So you just basically are measuring activity from somebody's brain without making any invasive measurements, you're placing an electrode on the skull, measuring that minute electrical activity, and that gives us a clue that this person might be conscious. Dr. Srivas Chenu is a neuroscientist at the University of Kent. He has devised a technique which aims to uncover the true level of brain activity in patients believed to be in vegetative or minimally conscious states. Costas is a healthy subject demonstrating how the technique works. For 10 minutes, we collect activity from 128 sensors from their brain, and then from the data we collect, we look at the pattern of connections between brain areas as measured by these sensors. And it turns out that in the healthy young adult brain, the strongest connections tend to be between frontal and parietal areas, areas at the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And we know from a lot of neuroscience that these are the areas that sustain consciousness in the healthy brain. And that's exactly what you see here, this mohawk, as I'd like to call it, of connections that are strongest between those front and back areas. Those arcs indicate the strength of the connections. If you compare that to the next image, this is of a patient who is in a so-called vegetative state. And what you see is a dramatic loss of those connections compared to the healthy brain, where there are far fewer connections and also much weaker when they are there. In the third image, now you can see patients who has behaviorally the same profile as the previous patient. In this patient too, there is no evidence at the bedside that we can measure that indicates any awareness. They score the same on any clinical test and for all intents and purposes, they look like they're in a vegetative state. But if you measure the brain activity with the technique we've just shown, they produce this rich and detailed mohawk-like connectivity that is very similar to that seen in a healthy adult. In the UK, there is estimated to be up to 24,000 people in a vegetative or semi-conscious state. This means that although at times the patient seems awake, they have either limited awareness or no awareness of themselves or their environment. At present, the only way medical consultants can assess brain activity in a patient is to complete behavioural tests. Dr Cheno's technique approaches this assessment in a new way, by assessing the brain itself what we do know from a lot of neuroscience of consciousness is that these brain areas, what we call the frontoparietal cortex, uh, they have key areas that seem to connect with each other, so that seem to be talking to each other when people report having a sense of self, having a sense of experiencing the fact that they are there. And what turns out to be the case is that there are some patients in whom, though they have no evidence of behavior, you can see activity potentially coming from those brain areas registering on the EEG signal. Although he didn't really respond to anything, I knew he was there. Just by looking into his eyes, I knew my husband was there. Because he was in the low awareness state, sometimes his responses, like I would say to him, look at me, and I'd move. And it could be two minutes later, three minutes later, and his eyes would move. 
And, and that's when I thought, he's there. We had a telephone call uh, at about half past ten at night was saying that Ruth had gone into a, uh, well... Had some sort of heart, yes. It was actually a cardiac arrest. Nobody actually said to us that Ruth would not recover. Often the first thing they want to know is, are they going to improve? Are they going to get better? Is there anything you can do? What can we do to make things better? Assessing brain activity is not a new practice, but until now it has never been assessed at the bedside so easily. A previous technique breakthrough came when patients were assessed in an MRI machine while being asked to imagine playing tennis. When we imagine doing some sort of physical kinesthetic action, there's a particular bit of your brain that lights up in an MRI scanner, and that's called the supplementary motor area. And by measuring activity there, we're demonstrating that even if this patient can't actually play tennis, they are well able to imagine that action on demand. And that's why that task became really popular as a means to assess what we would now call hidden awareness or covert awareness that isn't expressed at the bedside. The areas of the brain that sort of create an awareness of, the, of one's own self, that create an awareness of the fact that somebody's asking you to do something and then enable you to actually perform that task, those are the brain areas that we're measuring activity from with EEG. By doing that, what we're trying to do is assess patients more easily. We don't have to ask them to do something. And also we can do it at the bedside. Because remember, with the tennis, you need an MRI scanner, which is very expensive, and most patients can't go in one. And what's more, many patients might be unable to understand instructions because of aphasia, so damage, damage to the language areas. So might not be able to play tennis, might still be conscious. So what we're trying to do with this task, the simple assessment with, with EEG, is to just ask them to be at rest and measure the brain activity during that time. Headway House is a centre for patients who have suffered from a brain injury. These patients are now free from life support interventions and are working towards as full a recovery as possible. I went out one Christmas, went to a pub. A friend of mine got a fiberglass sports car for Christmas. He said, if you're still here when I get back, I'll give you a lift home. So he came back, I suppose about 10 minutes before the pub closed. We had one more drink and then he drove me home. And my 15 minute cycle journey lasted about six months. He um, lost control going up a hill and hit a telegraph pole. Neither of us were in seat belts, but they weren't obligatory then. As I come out of the dashboard, I caught a glance and blow on the telegraph pole, which caused all damage on the left hand side. Got to hospital, they called in my parents. Apparently, I said I'm very, very sorry to my parents and then didn't know another thing for about four weeks. Um, during that four weeks, I had some very, very interesting experiences within my own mind. Some of the patients we see who have what we call severe brain injury, much more severe, don't necessarily wake up as quickly as you have, right? And that's a challenge that is particularly problematic in a hospital where doctors are trying to understand how much brain injury there is, what chances are for recovery, so what we have tried to do is try and understand what can, what we know about consciousness and the brain, tell us about how much recovery is possible, how long it's going to take, etc., etc. It's likely that these patients are conscious, but they're not conscious in the way that you might experience consciousness. And that's the most remarkable thing, that you can have consciousness, as you perceive it, in the absence of memory. Although that's another interesting thing. Right. Do we actually exist without memory? Very good question. This is really getting yeah, philosophical. Sorry, getting early, isn't it? <laughs> These are hard questions. The aim of being here today is for us to, first of all, understand the experiences of patients who've been through brain injury but are now able to tell us what it was like, but also for us to be able to explain the science to them and inform the general public and inform patients about what's possible. Informing the public on scientific advancements is obviously very important as is the accurate reporting of cases which feature brain injury by the media. The generic word coma is used a lot in the media. It's nice and short for headlines. Everyone thinks they understand what a coma is. 
Professor Jenny Kitzinger is the co-director of the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Center. She has conducted a study of 2,000 news reports over the last 10 years to assess the accuracy of the language used. The term vegetative may be less likely to be used and the term minimally conscious even less likely. So the media both sensationalizes this but also promulgates confusion about these different diagnostic categories. Vegetative state has sort of come to sort of stick with us but is ultimately pejorative in the sense that it is automatically implying that somebody in a vegetative state could have no cognition, no more than a vegetable. And of course, that's far from what we find. And hence, a new term is something clinicians and I have been proposing should be used, and that's called the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. I do think we need to find new terminology. It's something me and my colleagues are always talking about the world over. If you say to a family member, um, your loved one's in a vegetative state, what 99% of the time they hear is, your loved one's a vegetable. Um, and we get that told to us numerous times by the families of our patients that they hear vegetable, they don't hear vegetative. It means nothing to them. I do think there's a good reason for understanding brain activity, particularly in areas of disorder of consciousness. We know that many people are misdiagnosed as being in a vegetative state when actually their awareness is much higher. We know we can miss people that are in a locked-in syndrome um, because we don't understand at, at the moment of the accident or shortly after what activity is there. We did ask for a brain scan at, at one yeah. stage, didn't we? But I didn't want to know the result. Um, I, I, I would be, I would like to know. I, I would like to know one of the brain's activities um, because at that stage, it seems to me um, you'd, you'd be more uh, aware of what is or is not possible. Um, and I think I would like to know that. Glass half full, glass half empty. <laughs> I don't want to know what the limitations are. Um, and I think if you want to know how far you can go forward, you've also got to be aware of what the limitations are. I don't want to know that. Really fascinating research there, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Dr. Srivast Chenu, Dr. Anita Rose, and also Professor David Menon, who are all here to answer your questions, which you can send in via YouTube and Facebook on the live comments panel. So do keep them coming in, and we'll get those answered uh, over the course of this live Q&A. Um, first of all, Srivast, let's come to you. Um, let's go back to the very beginning. How did you... Uh, develop the, the technology around the Mohawk and, and that really interesting um, bathing cap uh, measuring uh, piece of equipment that you, you talked about in the, at the start of the film. Yes, yeah, so I think when we started working on this research, there was a fairly established set of uh, scientific ideas around the fact that there could be hidden awareness in some patients, certainly by no means in many patients, but there could be the possibility that some of these so-called vegetative patients might have hidden awareness. And we got started at that point asking, well, that's really interesting and you know, really begs a severe clinical question, what do we ought to do? And one of the key challenges is, was, well, you can't really uh, take every patient in an MRI scanner or take the MRI scanner uh, to the patient to sort of ask them to imagine playing tennis. And we, at that point, got started in, towards building a system that could be taken to the patient and would be much less onerous for the patient. So instead of asking to so imagine playing tennis, can we do something simpler? Can we look at brain activity and come up with some way to assess it? And that's kind of what the research got started at. And we built upon a lot of work, work to do uh, with anesthesia, to do with other sorts of states of consciousness, to make sure that the technique we were building was working. And then we started using that with patients. And it's a really interesting notion, I think it's mentioned by um, Keith uh, at, at Headway House there, about the, the, those kind of definitions of consciousness. And, and I'll be coming on to that uh, a little bit later on. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions about that as well. Um, but Anita, I want to come to you next, because um, we heard Shivas there talking about 
um, making this technology available to uh, to patients and, and helping with uh, with assessing and with treating um, those patients. Tell us a little bit about your role at the Raphael Hospital and and how and what your role entails with working with with patients with various states of consciousness. So my role is very much about assessing patients when they first come into the hospital to try and determine what lev um, potential they have, I guess, for rehabilitation. So if we take patients that are coming in in some low awareness state, what we want to understand is what level of consciousness they have, what we can use to help raise that level of consciousness to move them forward and to rehabilitate their needs and and that's the most complex piece of work to do because currently at the moment the Chavez has already mentioned we use pencil paper tasks we use physical tasks but we may not be actually picking up what they are capable of doing because we're not being able to tap in um, into their brain waves in the same way. And I think technology is certainly a way forward, but at the moment we don't have that as day-to-day -day equipment ready for us. And David, how pioneering is that, the, the work that Srivas has done and, and making that accessible from the bedside that we've heard about? How pioneering is that for, for this field? So it's very impressive uh, because as the film said, um, we and other people have used MRI to try and identify patients who have the ability to respond to commands. But there are a couple of difficulties with that. One is taking patients into an MRI scan is always a bit of an undertaking, particularly in the acute phases when patients are just recovering from severe brain injury. The second is we know that these patients who have lower awareness states have fluctuating levels of consciousness. And you might just catch them in an MRI scanner when they were at a particularly low point in the level of consciousness and their ability to imagine playing tennis, if that's the test you're going to use, would simply not register as positive. The implementation of EEG recording, which Srivas has uh, provided, means that we no longer have to bring the patient to the diagnostic tool. We can take the diagnostic tool to the patient not just within hospitals, but also within care homes where these patients spend a substantial part of their uh, rehabilitation and sometimes have to stay long term and assess exactly how efficient this communication highway uh, between the back and the front of the brain, the so-called Mohawk of consciousness, is active in an individual patient, not just in a cross-sectional way, but across time and find out when and how these uh, states of connectivity are fluctuating. This gives us uh, a really good assessment of what's happening to connectivity in the brain. And it's that ability to, to implement it, to apply it to individual patients over long periods of time, that's a great boon clinically. And of course, there's those really striking images that we see throughout the film of the um, of the Mohawk of consciousness in use. That really, those really colourful, powerful um, images. Um, we've actually had our first question in a, uh, from Fiona uh, in Tunbridge about that sort of um, area. Um, Shrivas, Fiona wants to know: Can neuroimaging devices predict how quickly a person will recover from a brain injury and how much they will recover in rehabilitation? That's a really good question and a hard one often to answer. The first thing to say is that a lot of factors determine whether somebody makes a good recovery or not, not the least their age, the sort of injury they've suffered, the sort of early care that David referred to that they've received. All these sort of really play into the chances somebody has. So it really speaks to being there at the early period after injury to make sure we're giving them the right sort of, and the best sort of treatment. The technology that we're talking about here essentially allows us to capture the progression, allows us to say something about, well, if this much activity can be observed, you know, those colorful pictures you've seen, they're a sort of visual way of presenting that information. If there's a certain amount of activity that's preserved and there's a certain pattern to it, we do have evidence that patients who have got a good, uh, strong pattern of connectivity do go on to make a better recovery. But the causes of why they have that pattern are complex. But definitely there's a search we've published and also by other groups showing that a strong pattern of connectivity of that one that you saw there in the video is 
predictive, sort of indicative of the possi possibility and the potential for the recovery of consciousness in the future. in that question and all of you watching on YouTube and Facebook uh, do keep those questions coming in. Um, Shrivas, you were saying there about um, the, the kind of assessing those different states of consciousness and Anita, I want to know from you because we saw uh, quite near the start of that film that there's 24, I think it was 24,000 people are in a vegetative or semi-conscious state um, in the UK. What does that actually mean to be in a semi-conscious or a vegetative state? I can't say exactly what it means because I've not been in that state, but what it predominantly means is that a person has no awareness of themselves or their surroundings. So they're unable to communicate to us. So they could be in pain, they could be in low mood, they could be frightened, but they can't communicate that to us. There's no way that they're able to communicate. And obviously, depending on the denseness of their um, consciousness will de determine whether there is any element of communication. And, and it's very difficult because we can't be inside that person. We can't understand how they feel, how they think. We can't understand whether they are trying to speak to us, communicate to us in any way whether they're trying to let us know something. And we can't know whether what we're telling them is actually making any difference to them or supporting them in any way. Um, so it really is being completely locked away and out of contact out with anybody. And just off the back of that, Anita, do we know how many possible states of semi-consciousness there are. You, you mentioned their locked-in syndrome, and we saw uh, some of the patients in the film with, with what looked like varying degrees of um, responsiveness. Do we know exactly how many degrees of, of uh, unresponsiveness there are? I think we, we've categorised, we're very good, aren't we, as, as uh, clinicians and academics to categorise. So we've categorised um, terms of so we have the coma um, which is normally what after your straight after an injury you may end up in a coma you may emerge from that coma and be um, fine and be able to communicate you may not you then might but then we have other categories like the vegetative state as we've talked about or as Srivast says you know we want to try and think of other terminologies for that as I said on the film people hear that as vegetable we then look at the minimum conscious state and we separate that into minimum conscious minus and minimum conscious plus. So in other words, somebody's moving up a continuum of consciousness. We then say when somebody's emerged, when they're able to give us an accurate yes, no response. Um, but then, you know, consciousness is on a continuum from us now being very conscious and very engaging with um, our community around us and through this film being interactive with others that are watching it right down to that coma state so there are many levels but we've categorized perhaps four or five that we use academically and Shrivas, you mentioned in the film about using the definition unresponsive wakefulness syndrome um, what does that mean and why should that term do you feel be used more in, in common parlance yes and that's something we uh, have talked a lot about in the academic literature in this context. And you know, the term vegetative state has stuck. And you know, it's it's sort of in a sense catchy because people can sort of relate to the concept of, oh, you know, it's it's somebody is in a vegetative state. That term has a certain uh, you know uh, sort of attachment that sort of people have to it. But uh, the term unresponsive wakefulness is a term that is perhaps more accurate because it reflects the fact that we don't know whether this patient is truly awake or not. So we sort of are saying this patient seems unresponsive. They're awake. In many cases, patients in these so-called states aren't in a coma, as it's been pointed out. They have, they're awake. They sort of seem to be awake. They seem to be there, but it's not quite clear if they actually are there or not. So the term unresponsive wakefulness, though it's a bit more long-winded, does capture that. And it does matter that we use the right sort of terminology because if we don't, then it sort of affects everything we talk about in the public domain and of course also affects the sort of decision making that uh, is uh, going on behind the scenes on behalf of these patients. 
Uh, and we heard from Professor Jenny Kitzinger in the film as well. She's talking about how the co- how the cognitive state and various cognitive states are discussed in the media. Um, David, do you feel that the media really understand those various levels of consciousness and they treat it in the appropriate way? I mean, we, we've seen in the past, I'm thinking, you know, specifically of cases with, um, f- you know, former Formula One racer Michael Schumacher and how he's uh, in an induced coma and how that's been treated by certain outlets. Um, do you feel the media have quite grasped what it means to be in those different um, states of, of responsiveness? I, I don't think they have. Uh, and to be absolutely frank, many clinicians haven't either. So when patients come and ask uh, their clinicians, is my son, daughter, wife, husband going to wake up? What they mean is, is the person going to return to what they were like before? But someone who is in a vegetative state and an unresponsive wakefulness state has woken up. They've got sleep wake cycles. That's one of the part, that's part of the definition. But they haven't returned to a level of consciousness that's anywhere like they were before. And clinicians sometimes don't uh, use precision in trying to differentiate these. A lot of the disorders of consciousness uh, are lumped together. To be fair, in the acute phase, it's it's moving target. When patients are, are recovering from acute brain injury, the effects of the brain injury are resolving, the process of repair and recovery are, are slowly um, piecing bits together. And the effects of sedative drugs, which we very commonly use in the acute phase after injury, are slowly dissipating. But there is no individual site. So if you wanted me to tell you which part of my brain moves the right hand that I have, I can tell you it's this bit of my brain on the left hand side. But consciousness isn't a phenomenon that relies on sites. It's a phenomenon that relies on systems. The different parts of the brain have to connect. And trying to find a imaging correlate on a standard MRI makes it much more difficult uh, for us to relate that to, to patients. So certainly the, the um, media don't get it right. And many clinicians tend to talk about it in, in non-precise terms. And we could certainly do with having more precision here. And how, how would that, uh, you know, are there kind of ways that that can be done by the media and clinicians? Uh, how would you see that they can kind of grasp that better and, and also to inform the public better about it as well. We saw um, Shrivas at Headway House and, and about the importance of informing the public. Are there ways that maybe that can be, can be done more effectively, do you think, David? I'm sure we can. The difficulty is uh, finding a way for the average member of the public to relate to these patients and these states of consciousness. Everyone can relate to coma because you see it very often in films and television programs. And many of us have had the experience of having a friend or a loved one taken to hospital in a coma because of an accident or a stroke. So that's something we're familiar with. But if you take traumatic brain injury, people who have a, an accident or a fall and then have an injury to the brain, only about 1% of those patients will wind up in a, in a vegetative state uh, or a disorder of consciousness, let's say. If you take patients uh, like that, the most severe patients with brain injury, about 20% will die. Many patients will be disabled. But statistically, the chances of us being able to relate to an individual who's in such a state is very small. We won't be familiar with it. So the context in which you would actually have to encounter these terms is, is less common. Uh, The second thing is that the concepts are much more difficult. It's easy to say someone is comatose or has recovered from coma, has emerged from coma. But this is the gray area between those two extremes and finding uh, 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 staging posts along it that allow us to tell patients and their relatives exactly what those mean are, are more difficult. To be fair to them, neuroscientists and clinicians are still coming to terms with many of those. So it's not an easy job. 
absolutely not. Um, and, you know, as we've heard in, in the film and we've spoken about previously, that the implications of this research um, are really far reaching um, with the public and also with academia as well. Um, and we've had a, a testimonial sent in uh, by uh, Olivia Grossier, who is uh, an academic at the University of Liège. Um, she's been using Srivas's um, research and she sent in this short clip uh, talking about the film and about that research. So the documentary well depicts our reality, um, as it can be very difficult to know if someone is conscious or not. And so we have learned that responsiveness is different from consciousness, because someone may not be able to move and yet be conscious. So Dr. Shiva Chenu's work is very important, and it's a great tool because it's easy to use at the website, and there is no need for the patient to understand or to do a specific task. So he just needs to be awake and not to move too much so we can record the brain activity. So in, uh, in, in the Coma Science Group at the University of Liège in Belgium, we use the Mohawk of consciousness in your, our clinical routine um, because we see patients with disorders of consciousness after a coma and then they come to our hospital for diagnosis, prognosis and treatment workup and we use the, the, the methodology developed by Dr. Srivas Chenu, along other brain imaging techniques. Um, also, like you have seen in the documentary, the imaging playing tennis with the fMRI. So I think these techniques can guide um, um, for the care and it can also help for decision making. So for example, uh, if a person is diagnosed uh, in an unresponsive state, but then the neuroimaging uh, shows brain activity that is compatible with the minimally conscious states, then we can propose to intensify the care. So maybe we can propose brain stimulation or pharmacological treatment because we see that in the brain, there is a potential to recover consciousness. On the other side, if um, a person, if all the, the, the results come negative, then, and we don't see any brain activity, then the person, if this person has been in that state for a long time, um, there's little chance of recovery. And then with the family, we may more discuss about end of life decision. So for example, if a person developed pneumonia, what do we do? Do we just not treat? So we collaborate a lot with the family and uh, we also try to include them in our research work because it's important. They know the patient more than we do and they can see things that clinicians do not see. So I think it's important that we have family and patients when they can to be actively participating in our research. Um, a last precision tool is that, as it was also mentioned in the documentary, no technique is perfect at the individual level. So even the one that we have presented in the, in the documentary. So it's still possible to have wrong results. So this is why first we continue our work. We're trying to develop more uh, methods and technique. But most importantly, that's why uh, we use different technique. And um, we really look at the global results before reaching any decision. So it's important to do this multimodal assessment of the level of consciousness. Big thank you to Olivia for sending that in and also to you at home uh, for watching on YouTube and Facebook. Do keep those questions coming in and we'll get them answered by our panel. We've had a few come in and we'll get those answered in just a sec. But Shrivas, I want to come back to you um, off the back of what Olivia said. And um, uh, as I mentioned, she's working at the University of uh, Liège in Belgium. Um, and obviously this research has those really wide, um, wide ranging uh, implications and it can be shared with other institutions as well and as you've said you've worked with uh, with other um, academic institutions how important is it to have that research community and and have those links with people like Olivia oh it's essential of course you know the clinicians we work with are, are a vital part of the system of uh, change we can sort of introduce as these technologies become available and they're advancing by the day Working with clinicians is essential to make sure that you can reach patients, reach their families, and sort of make sure that the technologies, as they progress, become available 
at the right time after they've passed the right sort of verification. So we work with clinicians in Cambridge, in Liège, in Belgium, as you've seen, and of course, in Germany, in a couple of other countries in Europe as well, to make sure that we, where the technology is available and can be used reliably, we do so. But of course, it's still limited because not all clinicians, like Dr. Rose has mentioned, are able to access the technology as yet. And that's still the road sort of we have to, to travel down on to make it available more widely, but without make, making sure that it's also reliable at the same time. David, we've had a we've had a question in um, asking: Do medically induced comas have different levels of consciousness? Um, I see that you you obviously work with the um, anesthesia department uh, in Cambridge. Um, do you want to maybe take this one? And uh, as I said, do medically induced comas have different levels of consciousness? Uh, we, absolutely. So um, my clinical work is primarily in the neurointensive care unit, but also in the past in anesthesia. And with the anesthetic agents we use, typically given intravenously, we can dial in a given level of consciousness. We can have people mildly sedated, but we can have them so deeply sedated that there's hardly any electrical activity in the brain. So we can uh, titrate uh, the, the level of sedation and anesthesia to whatever level you want. Uh, and what we know is uh, that both the resting key connectivity and also what happens to the EEG when you ask people to do things can allow us to detect uh, the ongoing connectivity between different parts of the brain that represent consciousness in patients who are on lower level of sedation or recovering from sedation. And that's really important because when patients first start to emerge from coma because of their injury, that they've had a head injury and they were in coma, we often sedate these people to protect the brain and, and allow them to be on a breathing machine. And then the sedation stops, but they're not responsive. And one key question in that circumstance is, are they not responsive because of the underlying disease? If it's because of the underlying disease, do they have the potential to recovery? But much more commonly, are they not responsive because of the uh, drugs we've given them and they've not just worn away? And giving them a bit more time might allow that to happen. And not the work uh, in the patients with disorders of consciousness, but, consciousness, but other work that three of us has done in conjunction with our group in healthy volunteers being sedated with anesthetic agents allows us to some extent to dis distinguish between the uh, the effects on the brain of the drugs from the effects on the brain from the injury and though this is not perfect any advance in that direction is really helpful because it allows us to dissect out the different causes of depression of consciousness and clearly something that's because of residual drugs is something that's eminently reversible and those uh, detriments in the level of consciousness because of the injury is not uh, that likely to be reversible but being able to dissect out that is really useful and um, we've also got a number of questions that have come in in relation to the ongoing coronavirus uh, pandemic um anita i want to come to you for this because we've um we're six weeks into doing this series and we've had um, films across academic disciplines and all of them have been impacted, um, as everybody in the world has been, by the, uh, the ongoing situation. Um, how's, how has your sector been, been impacted by the uh, COVID-19? Um, I think the main impact um, has been initially, like with everybody else, is trying to deal with the issue of lockdown. Um, initially, it was issues around getting the right equipment, PPE, getting the right um, things we needed to keep our patients safe. Um, we have been very successful in keeping our all our hospital sites COVID free. Um, and I think, you know, that's been a, a small miracle in itself. I think things like just getting practical stuff has been very difficult. But I think the hardest thing is for our patients because they we've obviously stopped visiting for safety reasons to keep our patients safe, our staff safe, and obviously our families safe. And I think for some of our patients that don't, can't articulate the way they feel that they're not seeing their families, it's been extremely difficult. And we are, we have seen changes in behavior, changes in interaction, and even in our, our low awareness patients, we have seen changes. 
and which tells me they are aware that their family aren't visiting. But I think that's been the hardest thing for all of us. We've done lots of FaceTiming, lots of Zoom chats with families. We've created um, hospital videos to send out to all the families for their, so they can see their patients being looked after. We've done lots of activities and put lots more things into the program alongside their rehab to try and help make them feel they're having a normal sense of day. But it has been, I think, quite challenging um, in, in our sites. We've had another question come in about that, um, Anita. Um, the, the question being, has COVID affected patients who have a disorder of consciousness in any ways? Um, have they been affected differently to patients um, uh, to other patients with with COVID, obviously we've seen those um, those images on on the TV of people on ventilators um, of wards being um, uh, being inundated with people. Um, how different uh, do we know at this stage how uh, patients with various states of unconsciousness would be affected differently to um, to others that have been affected by COVID? I don't think we know yet. Um, we do know that there has been a lot of research already coming out quite prolifically, looking at changes in the brain following someone having COVID, having to be on a ventilator. We're seeing changes, neuropsychological changes. Um, we are seeing more clinical changes, um, psychological changes. So there's a lot of research coming out. I think the thing with our patients in, in low awareness states is they're far more vulnerable to infection. So we, we're, I would suggest we're likely to see those patients perhaps being more affected if they do get the um, COVID virus than perhaps somebody that's more fit and able. Um, but as I say, we're definitely seeing a lot of um, evidence that there have been cognition changes in people's brains as a result of being on ventilators long term. Um, so I think it's a little bit of watch this space, but I think we're going to, we're certainly gearing ourselves up in the world of neurorehabilitation for um, an influx of patients needing more beds. And there's already NHS England and we're putting um, things in place for that to happen. So, but as I say, where's it's with low awareness state at the moment, um, I can't answer that question fully. I think you raise a really important point, though, that it's obviously not just the patients who are affected, but there's the families and, and wider relations as well that, that are affected um, uh, by d different states of, of responsiveness. Um, Shrivas, we heard obviously from Maureen, Jane and Ivan in the film, and I'm sure you've spoken to, to a number of families of patients um, as part of your research. What, what's been the response like? from families to the research that you've done um, and to those findings? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The families are a key part of a lot of what we do. And, you know, I really should take a moment to thank not just uh, Maureen and all the people who were on that film, but also all the families we worked with who are not in that film and, you know, have gone through some remarkable experiences. It's as much about them as it, of course, is about the patients themselves. Uh, and. By and large, you know, I have to say, uh, I'm always amazed by the fortitude of these families I speak to. They have dealt with remarkable circumstances, and they've, they've dealt with it in ways that are individual to them. As, as you saw at the end of the documentary, some want to know more about the state of the consciousness that their uh, loved one might be in, and others don't want to know. Some would like there to be more consciousness than... Uh, they expect others don't necessarily want that because that sort of then makes them ask more difficult questions. So really, I've seen a variety of responses, but across the board, what families want to know is they, they want some clarity. They want some better understanding of what to expect and how to think about their loved one because they know that they're there, and yet it's very unclear to them what sort of person remains and what chances they have of becoming or returning back, as David said, to that person they were. And almost always I, I get requests for more information than that. And what, what can that mean? You kind of spoke about it a little bit there, Shrivas, but what can that clarity bring to families and, and friends of, of patients in, um, in various states of responsiveness? Yeah, that's a good question. The technology we have, and you know, be playing tennis or you know, measuring mohawks, is never going to be perfect, as you've heard from Olivia as well. No technology, no test is 100% accurate, and we're not ever going to reach that point. So we 
as scientists, as clinicians, as academics, have to sort of uh, perhaps you know bridge that gap between that uncertainty we have and the certainty that families would like. So it's a continual process of sort of improving the technology, but also communicating what we can and cannot say. And in this case, when there's when you get clear patterns, then of course we can make clear statements. But it's not always possible. So what we always do is make sure that we provide the best information we can and also convey that uncertainty when there is uncertainty, sort of present the fuller picture so that families and, and the, the people responsible ultimately for the patients can make the right sort of decisions. And Anita, just a final word from you going forward. What impact do you think the research will, um, will have on our own, um, uh, on our understanding of this field and especially how you think the public will react. We heard David um, earlier on talking extensively about more work needing to be done to inform the public, to inform clinicians um, on, on everything from terminology to, to those various um, states that you spoke about earlier on. Um, going forward, how do you think that's going to change and do you think it will change? Um, I think it will change quite significantly. I think for me, this as a clinician, um, this is a vital piece of um, research that's going to bring into the field much more um, vital ways of assessing. I think Olivia, one of my colleagues, has already said that it's not just this piece of equipment. There's many other things we do together, but I think it will change the face of our understanding of consciousness. I think it will change our face and how we rehabilitate people in prolonged disorders of consciousness. I think it will change the face of our of the public's understanding of consciousness. I think it might hopefully bring it to a level we can be, as David said, bring it much more down to that layman's explanation of what is actually going on in somebody's brain when they are in this unresponsive wakefulness state. I think it will help us define consciousness better, which will in turn help our families and their friends to understand what their loved one is going through. Um, I, I just think it's going to change completely the face going forward of how we treat, assess and hopefully recover, um, recuperate patient, um, rehabilitate patients like this. And I think scientifically it's got a, a huge value as well. A lot of areas to look at going forward and it's going to be really exciting to keep tabs on that. Anita, Srivas and David, all thank you very much for joining us this evening for this live Q&A. And thanks to you at home uh, as well for watching and sending in your questions on Facebook and YouTube. And you'll have a chance to do so again uh, for the next edition of Kent Thinks Discovers, which will be back uh, next Wednesday, the 7th of July, um, for Leukemia Catching Cancer, where we'll explore a team from the Medway School of Pharmacy and how they've developed a pioneer way to trace and also to potentially treat the disease so all that to look forward to next week if you did miss uh, the Mohawk of Consciousness film at the top of the program uh, we'll be playing it for you again shortly but that's all from me for the time being thanks for joining and we'll see you again next week going to place this and you have to please keep your eyes closed I feel a bit weird it sort of looks like a bathing cap what we're doing here is taking the science of consciousness and building tools that we can use at the bedside to assess patients after brain injury to have a better estimate of how conscious they might be even if they can't express that in their behavior so you just basically are measuring activity from somebody's brain without making any invasive measurements, you're placing an electrode on the skull, measuring that minute electrical activity, and that gives us a clue that this person might be conscious. Dr. Srivas Chenu is a neuroscientist at the University of Kent. He has devised a technique which aims to uncover the true level of brain activity in patients believed to be in vegetative or minimally conscious states. Costas is a healthy subject demonstrating how the technique works. For 10 minutes, we collect activity from 128 sensors from their brain, and then from the data we collect, 
we look at the pattern of connections between brain areas as measured by these sensors. And it turns out that in the healthy young adult brain, the strongest connections tend to be between frontal and parietal areas, areas at the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And we know from a lot of neuroscience that these are the areas that sustain consciousness in the healthy brain. And that's exactly what you see here, this mohawk, as I'd like to call it, of connections that are strongest between those front and back areas. Those arcs indicate the strength of the connections. If you compare that to the next image, this is of a patient who is in a so-called vegetative state. And what you see is a dramatic loss of those connections compared to the healthy brain, where there are far fewer connections and also much weaker when they are there. In the third image, now you can see patients who has behaviorally the same profile as the previous patient. In this patient too, there is no evidence at the bedside that we can measure that indicates any awareness. They score the same on any clinical test and for all intents and purposes, they look like they're in a vegetative state. But if you measure the brain activity with the technique we've just shown, they produce this rich and detailed mohawk-like connectivity that is very similar to that seen in a healthy adult. In the UK, there is estimated to be up to 24,000 people in a vegetative or semi-conscious state. This means that although at times the patient seems awake, they have either limited awareness or no awareness of themselves or their environment. At present, the only way medical consultants can assess brain activity in a patient is to complete behavioural tests. Dr Cheno's technique approaches this assessment in a new way, by assessing the brain itself. What we do know from a lot of neuroscience of consciousness is that these brain areas, what we call the frontoparietal cortex, uh, they have key areas that seem to connect with each other, so that seem to be talking to each other when people report having a sense of self, having a sense of experiencing the fact that they are there. And what turns out to be the case is that there are some patients in whom, though they have no evidence of behavior, you can see activity potentially coming from those brain areas registering on the EEG signal. Although he didn't really respond to anything, I knew he was there. Just by looking into his eyes, I knew my husband was there. Because he was in the low awareness state, sometimes his responses, like I would say to him, look at me, and I'd move. And it could be two minutes later, three minutes later, and his eyes would move. And, and that's when I thought, he's there. We had a telephone call uh, at about half past 10 at night saying that Ruth had gone into a, uh, well... Had some sort of heart, yes. It was actually a cardiac arrest. Nobody actually said to us that Ruth would not recover. Often the first thing they want to know is, are they going to improve? Are they going to get better? Is there anything you can do? What can we do to make things better? Assessing brain activity is not a new practice, but until now it has never been assessed at the bedside so easily. A previous technique breakthrough came when patients were assessed in an MRI machine while being asked to imagine playing tennis. When we imagine doing some sort of physical kinesthetic action, there's a particular bit of your brain that lights up in an MRI scanner, and that's called the supplementary motor area. And by measuring activity there, we're demonstrating that even if this patient can't actually play tennis, they are well able to imagine that action on demand. And that's why that task became really popular as a means to assess what we would now call hidden awareness or covert awareness that isn't expressed at the bedside. The areas of the brain that sort of create an awareness of, the, of one's own self, that create an awareness of the fact that somebody's asking you to do something and then enable you to actually perform that task, those are the brain areas that we're measuring activity from with EEG. By doing that, what we're trying to do is assess patients more easily. We don't have to ask them to do something. And also we can do it at the bedside. Because remember, with the tennis, you need an MRI scanner, which is very expensive, and most patients can't go in one. And what's more, many patients might be unable to understand instructions because of aphasia, so damage, damage to the language areas. So might not be able to play tennis, might still be conscious. So what we're trying to do with this task, the simple assessment with, with EEG, is to just ask them to be at rest and measure the brain activity during that time. 
Headway House is a centre for patients who have suffered from a brain injury. These patients are now free from life support interventions and are working towards as full a recovery as possible. I went out one Christmas, went to a pub. A friend of mine got a fiberglass sports car for Christmas. He said, if you're still here when I get back, I'll give you a lift home. So he came back, I suppose about 10 minutes before the pub closed. We had one more drink and then he drove me home. And my 15 minute cycle journey he lasted about six months. He um, lost control going up a hill and hit a telegraph pole. Neither of us were in seat belts, but they weren't obligatory then. As I come out of the dashboard, I caught a glancing blow on the telegraph pole, which caused all damage on the left hand side. Got to hospital, they called in my parents. Apparently, I said I'm very, very sorry to my parents and then didn't know another thing for about four weeks. Um, during that four weeks, I had some very, very interesting experiences within my own mind. Some of the patients we see who have what we call severe brain injury, much more severe, don't necessarily wake up as quickly as you have, right? And that's a challenge that is particularly problematic in a hospital where doctors are trying to understand how much brain injury there is, what chances are for recovery, so what we have tried to do is try and understand what can, what we know about consciousness and the brain, tell us about how much recovery is possible, how long it's going to take, etc., etc. It's likely that these patients are conscious, but they're not conscious in the way that you might experience consciousness. And that's the most remarkable thing, that you can have consciousness, as you perceive it, in the absence of memory. Although that's another interesting thing. Right. Do we actually exist without memory? Very good question. This is really getting yeah, philosophical. Sorry, getting quite early, isn't it? <laughs> These are hard questions. The aim of being here today is for us to, first of all, understand the experiences of patients who've been through brain injury but are now able to tell us what it was like. But also for us to be able to explain the science to them and inform the general public and inform patients about what's possible. Informing the public on scientific advancements is obviously very important as is the accurate reporting of cases which feature brain injury by the media. The generic word coma is used a lot in the media. It's nice and short for headlines. Everyone thinks they understand what a coma is. Professor Jenny Kitzinger is the co-director of the Coma and Disorders of Consciousness Research Centre. She has conducted a study of 2,000 news reports over the last 10 years to assess the accuracy of the language used. The term vegetative may be less likely to be used and the term minimally conscious even less likely. So the media both sensationalizes this, but also promulgates confusion about these different diagnostic categories. Vegetative state has sort of come to sort of stick with us, but is ultimately pejorative in the sense that it is automatically implying that somebody in a vegetative state could have no cognition, no more than a vegetable. And of course, that's far from what we find. And hence, a new term is something clinicians and I have been proposing should be used and that's called the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. I do think we need to find new terminology. It's something me and my colleagues are always talking about the world over. If you say to a family member, um, your loved one's in a vegetative state, what 99% of the time they hear is your loved one's a vegetable. Um, and we get that told to us numerous times by the families of our patients that they hear vegetable, they don't hear vegetative. It means nothing to them. I do think there's a good reason for understanding brain activity, particularly in areas of disorder of consciousness. We know that many people are misdiagnosed as being in a vegetative state when actually their awareness is much higher. We know we can miss people that are in a locked-in syndrome um, because we don't understand at, at the moment of the accident or shortly after what activity is there. We did ask for a brain scan at one yeah. stage, didn't we? But I didn't want to know the result. Um, I, I, I would be, I would like to know, I, I would like to know on the brain's activities, um, because at that stage, it seems to me, um, you'd, you'd be more uh, aware of what is or is not possible. Um, and I think I would like to know that. Glass half full, glass half empty. <laughs> I don't want to know what the limitations are. 
Um, and I think if you want to know how far you can go forward, you've also got to be aware of what the limitations are. I don't want to know that.